Good morning to you. It's a joy to be back. I got a text from Brother Rick. He said, I'm glad you're home. Now I can stop praying for you. <laughs> he said, I was only teasing. I said, I hope so. Amen. We love it. Thank God for his goodness to us. And, and uh, this is the longest trip I've been away for a little over a month. But the Lord helped us, and uh, I thank you for your prayers, and I praise God for all he's accomplishing. I'd ask you to turn with me in your Bible this morning to the book of Titus, to the book of Titus. I've been praying and asking the Lord what he would have me to share when I'm in the pulpit, so the Lord impressed my heart with Titus, so we're going to start in book of Titus this morning. Let me encourage you to stand in the honor of the reading of God's Word and let's look at chapter 1, verse 1 for our scripture reading. The Bible says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. I hope in the hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. It's a powerful verse. Mm -hmm. Verse 3, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, uh, my own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. 
We'll stop there for our scripture reading. We thank the Lord for his goodness to us uh, in having the privilege to gather this morning in the house of God. Father, we ask you in Jesus' name to glorify yourself through the preaching and the teaching of the gospel. And we are not to bring glory to yourself in all that's said and done. We ask you now, Lord Jesus, to give us liberty. I beg you, Lord, to fill me with the Spirit of God and give me the tongue of the learned to give a word in season today. Father, we love you. We love the Word of God. And we thank you for the privilege to stand and proclaim. Fill me with thy spirit. Help me, Lord, to minister to the saints of God this morning. We need to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can be seated. One of the areas of my responsibility of teaching while I was in Egypt this time and in South Sudan was to teach the pastoral theology class and what a blessing it was for me to be able to review First and Second Timothy and Titus. It's interesting that these three books are called pastoral uh, epistles, meaning by that they were written to the pastor at two different churches and they were, of course, uh, Paul's servants and helpers, Timothy and Titus. The order of the writing of the books are 1 Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy. As most of you know, 2 Timothy was Paul's swan song. It was the last message that he gave before he was beheaded for the gospel. Now, when we look at these three epistles, there is a key word that's repeated over and over throughout them, and that is the word sound doctrine. It's interesting that the word sound comes from the Greek word, which uh, is translated into our English language, wholesome. The idea is that the doctrine is healthy for you. Amen. And that it is wholesome to take care of us as the uh, children of God. Now, today, as we're looking at the book of Titus, I'll give you a little background. I was studying and praying concerning the next direction of the Lord and preaching and teaching. And so it came to my heart the words of Dr. Avery Rogers. Dr. Avery Rogers is now with the Lord, not Adrian, Avery Rogers from Victoria, Texas. And he would often stay in my home when he came to preach for us in our conferences. And he would say to me, uh, have you studied such and such? Have you read such and such? And he was always driven me. And he made this statement. He said, have you ever studied good works. And I remembered that and he said if you're going to study good works, study Titus. And I want to say to you that God has really helped me in so many ways in this study. Look if you will at chapter 3 and look at verse 8. This is a faithful saying and these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Now the word good works are found many times. I think it's interesting. It's found in the New Testament 13 times and it's found eight times in Titus. It's an emphasis that I think has often been overlooked, especially by those of us that are uh, believing in the Reformed soteriology 
that salvation is the Lord and that God must save sinners because we have learned that the strong emphasis of the doctrine of salvation is we are justified by grace through faith and not of works. The second chapter of Ephesians tells us that there is a problem with men boasting if it is grace plus works. Anytime you add anything to grace, you're taking away from grace. So we need to understand that we are to do good works because we have been saved. And it's not to be saved. And so when we study the book of Titus, we are made clear that it's all of the grace of God and that the blessing of the Lord that comes to us comes to us in the fact that he hath equipped us and he enables us to do good works. Now notice, if you will, with me, as a part of the introduction, uh, there are three points I want to point out to you today. I don't know if I'll get to all of them this morning. I may have to do it tonight. But the first of them is the man, Titus. We want to talk about Titus. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the man that uh, discipled him, and that's the Apostle Paul. Also, we'll look not only at the man, but we'll look at the major message of the book of Titus so that we can lay down markers for the direction of the study. And then thirdly, it's a blessing for us to see in this series of studies the mandate of godliness is good works. We'll talk about that as we go through the book of Titus. Notice, if you will, with me in chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. I believe that if God ever works saving grace by the truth of the gospel into your heart, it will produce godliness. Mm -hmm. We're living in a generation that talks about salvation as a ticket to heaven, and there is no desire to live for God, no desire to exalt and glorify His name. But in this very first verse, we see that Paul was the human author, that it's an inspired book coming directly from God. But as Paul's custom was, and the writers of that generation, they would put their name at the beginning of the letter. Sometimes I think that would be a good thing for us today. We put ours at the end of the letter and you don't read, dear so-and-so, you turn over there and it says sincerely yours and they've got the name. So you go all the way to the back of the letter to make sure that you find out who's writing. But Paul put his name at the very first. We know that uh, his name was Saul. He was Saul of Tarsus. And in my preparation and study this time, I was made aware of the fact that probably his name Saul and Paul were both given to him at birth. I'd never read that before. Uh, their indication was that it was the custom oftentimes for the Lord Jesus to give a new name to the convert, but that did not happen in this case. You remember Saul went on to Antioch of Syria, and the church there sent him out on the first missionary journey. And as he went out, the Bible tells us that he went first uh, to the to uh, Barnabas' home, which was the island off the shore there, and it was an amazing thing, but he confronted the enemy, first thing, and after it was over with, he changed his name from Saul to Paul. And uh, then on, we find in all of his writings, he signed Paul. 
Now let me just simply say to you, the significance is the name Saul, of course, was the name of the first king of Israel. And the problem with Saul was that uh, he felt himself very important after a period of time. As Paul was going along, he felt less important. But the gospel was the important thing in his life. And let me just say to you, his name Paul means to be little. He was little in his own eyes. He was little in the eyes of God. And he wanted to be little in the eyes of everyone else. He was not interested in drawing attention to himself. But he wanted to give great attention to Jesus Christ. So he says, I'm a servant. Let me remind you that Paul says, I'm a doulos, that is a bond slave. And it's an interesting thing, there's a difference in a man that is, is uh, purchased in the slave market and made a slave over against a man that was a doulos. A doulos was one that chose to be a slave. A lot of times the uh, slave or the individual was purchased by someone. Sometimes they even surrendered themselves because of their debt to be a servant to another. But they would often marry, they'd have children. And rather than leave their wife and children under the master, he would say, I want to be a doulos. I want to be a volunteer. I want you to know I want you as my master. And so they'd have a little ceremony long before the piercing of ears came into focus in our generation. The man that was a doulos, a slave by choice, he would back up to a post and they would put a hot all through his ear and uh, I heard the young fellow say that must have been painful to run up all through both ears and out the other. I said no brother, they didn't do it that way. I'm helping them and they're trying to help me I guess. But it was like in the ear roll. And let me just simply say this to you, the rest of his life he was a servant and a slave to his master. Paul said, my life belongs to Jesus Christ. He's my savior. And I want to be his by volunteering and saying, I want to give myself to Jesus Christ in servitude. And whatever he asks of me, I'm going to obey him. Let me just say this to you before we get through the book of Titus. We're going to see that this thing of good works has a lot to do with the same thing. You can only have good works that please God if they're done by faith. We'll talk about other things in this same subject area. You can only do good works when you do them for the glory of Jesus Christ. So Paul had settled all of that. He had given himself to Christ Jesus and out of love for his Savior who bought him out of the slave market of sin and made him his servant, Paul said, I choose Jesus Christ to be my Lord and my Master. Let me go on to point out to you, it says that he was a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. This is significant. Any book that you open up and start studying that the Apostle Paul penned, uh, he will always put in there that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was an apostle born out of due season. You remember the 12, and the Bible tells us that one of them was was not a believer, Judas Iscariot, that he was a reprobate, and the Bible tells us that he went to hell. But let me remind you, there was another that replaced him, uh, Matthias, in the upper room in Acts chapter 1. Uh, but 
God had yet another apostle that would be significant in the program of God. He would be the apostle to the Gentiles. And let me say to you, the other 12 were apostles to the Jews. But this man is the apostle Paul, and he was God's representative. A, an apostle was a sent one. And praise be to God from the time that God saved Saul of Tarsus and made him an apostle of Jesus Christ, there was no turning back. He was totally devoted in every way to Jesus Christ. I, uh, I need to move on, but let me just simply plead with you to understand that at this point, he is a bond slave by choice. He's a servant, but he is an apostle. And he is an unusual apostle. For he was sent by Almighty God to the Gentiles. And he went out of the church of Antioch, Syria, in Acts chapter 13, which was a Gentile church. And he went on his missionary journeys, establishing churches. What a glorious message as the sent one. He was consistent in every way. But notice what he said according to the faith of God's elect. This is an important statement. I want you to understand that many folk are afraid of the doctrine of election. But to set you at peace about it concerning this portion of Scripture, he calls the church the elect of God. And what is significant here is he says, according to the faith of God's elect. Uh, as I looked at this, I was reminded of 1 Timothy chapter 3, where it teaches us that uh, Jesus Christ himself, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 16, uh, that he was talking about the principles of the faith. They are the pillar and the ground of truth. Uh, what is he talking about by the ground of truth? And we'll try to enlarge it maybe a little later on. He was talking about the foundation being uh, the apostles and the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. Let me tell you that the faith here is not talking about personal saving faith. It's talking about the Word of God, the principles of the Word of God. And what a significant thing it is when we understand that the Bible tells us that it was according to the faith of God's elect. Do you know those that are truly saved and born again, every one of them profess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Every one of them will not in any way deny the faith concerning justification being by grace through faith. Let me again point out to you, there's never been a man that was born again and saved by the grace of God that didn't agree in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Let me share with you, they believed in the fact as it says in chapter uh, 3 of 1 Timothy, and I'm not going there for time's sake, but it's interesting that he says that the church is the a pillar and ground of the truth. God has one program in the world today. You know what that program is? The local church. And the church is built on the foundation of the apostles' doctrine and the cornerstone is Jesus Christ. But it also speaks of the pillars of truth. And pillars hold up the building. And I love that. The church is born again, body of believers. It's a true church of Jesus Christ. It's interesting that God calls them the elect of God, but he also refers to them as pillars. Let me share with you, if you go to Greece or to Rome or any of these uh, old countries where there's still remains of temples and remains of uh, facilities that are there, you know what's standing? 
pillars. The whole thing's gone. It's collapsed. It's fallen in, but the pillars are still standing. I like that concept. Let me just say this to you. If you are born again, and you're one of the elect of God, the Apostle Paul said we all agree that there's only one Savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. In the faith of God's elect, amen, the principles of the faith of the New Testament in particular. And notice the next thing, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after God. See, here is the important thing. This expression, acknowledging or the acknowledgement, the knowledge of the truth. You say, Pastor Dave, what in the world is he talking about? When God saved you, he put in you the Holy Spirit. And that's the enabling grace to do good works. And what's significant about the whole thing as we look at it together here today is that the work of the Holy Spirit of God in us continues until he takes us on. You say, what do you mean? The Bible teaches we're to grow in knowledge. Let me ask you, do you love the truth of the Word of God enough that you get up early enough in the morning and spend time with God? Opening the lids of the Word of God and reading it and trusting God to teach you the Word of God because Yes, Christian education is very much a part of the true church of Jesus Christ. We want to grow in knowledge. We want to grow in knowing Him. And if there is no desire for truth, there is a lack of evidence of one being born again. Look at it further. Which is after God. If we have true Christian education, going on and it's a process of sanctification and the church has uh, been faithful to preach and to teach the word of God line upon line and precept upon precept. The people grow in knowledge of the truth. And when they grow in the knowledge of the truth, they are brought to a place of spiritual maturity called godliness. God help us to understand that uh, there is a lot of difference in true saving grace and religious activity. Notice there, these things are all pointing to the fact that uh, the Apostle Paul and Timothy were in unity. I uh, came in the door and Brother Roy said to me, he said, we're glad to have you back. I said, I'm glad to be back. And then he said, but Pastor Allen's been doing great preaching. That I expect. The church that is a real church feeds on the Word of God. They have to be fed. You can't just go to church and sit there and hum, uh, I wish I was in the woods hunting, or I wish I was on the creek bank fishing. You should come to the house of God for the learning of the scriptures and truth that you might be used of God. And I hear an amen. This idea then also I would put in is that Timoth Timothy was half Jew and half Gentile. Therefore, you remember he went to the temple and it was required of him uh, that by Paul himself He'd be circumcised. Why? Because if he's going to minister to Jews, he needed to be circumcised to identify with the Jewish people. But not Titus. They refused to circumcise Titus. Titus was not a Jew. He was a Gentile. And you'll remember in uh, uh, Acts 15, there was the Jerusalem Council which determined that Gentiles did not have to become a Jew before he could become Christian. He was born again and experienced saving grace and that he would, as an individual, uh, not receive uh, the, he wouldn't receive baptism, but he would not receive 
circumcision. It was not necessary. In hope of eternal life, verse 2, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. I think it's important that I point out to you that God is the God of truth. Amen. And everything associated with our God has to do with truth. Right. God cannot lie. Right. Aren't you glad we got a Bible that is true? Yeah. Amen. And that you shall know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. We have been set free by the grace of God and the truth of the Word of God. Let me go on and point out to you, he was not only converted from heathenism who then afterwards attached himself to the Apostle Paul. He, like Timothy, was Paul's heifer. I, I love this. There's places like 2 Corinthians 12, 18 uh, that emphasizes the fact that he was a heifer of the Apostle Paul. Uh, Timothy was a heifer. Now, I recently read where someone said that they didn't think Titus was a pastor and said that he just went down there and filled the pulpit at Crete for a period of time, but uh, that Timothy was the pastor. Well, I disagree with that. First of all, I would simply say that Titus had the gifts a pastor teacher. And that's the reason Paul sent him. He went down to Crete. Now here's what I want to share with you about Crete. Crete had, uh, is an island and it was a place where a church had been planted. We don't have a clue who planted the church there. But it was in a mess. And God said, to Paul, send Timothy, or excuse me, send Titus down there and to set things in order. Let me just say this to you. Uh, the way that you bring a church around to truth and walking is you set things in order. And the first requirement to set things in order is that you establish qualified pastors to fill the role of pastor. They're called elders in the scripture. They're called pastors in the scripture. They're called bishops. And all three of those offices speak of one office, and that is the pastor. Now, what's significant about this thing is that Titus went down there and he received direct uh, instruction, which come under the mandate, from the Apostle Paul said the pastoral responsibilities in a correct order. You got to have pastors that are qualified. You can't have pastors that will do their own thing. They've got to be men of uh, the Word of God. And they, their home has to be right and they have to be blameless. That's what the Word of God says. The idea of that is there's no way you can get a handle on them because of sin that is in their life. So no one can criticize them and put them down. They may try to, but the very existence of godly living shuts the mouths of those that would attack God's servants. Let me plead with you to understand it's very important that godliness be seen here. He said, I hope, excuse me, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. What a blessed thought. You and I, and those of us that are pastors, and those of us that are a part of the program of God, none of us, even church members, uh, will deny the great blessing that God knew us before the foundations of the world. I want to tell you what keeps me going. I'm not an afterthought of God. 
things didn't get out of control and God did the best he could to put it all back together uh, because uh, uh, the wickedness of Adam's sin from generation to generation. No, praise God. I was a part of his eternal purposes. And I'm going to tell you uh, what a blessing it's been for me to be here for these many years. But I feel like that I was appointed to this place. You say, do you believe that? I've already asked Pastor Adam. I told him, if you don't feel that you are God's appointed one for this hour, we need to find somebody to eat it. You know what he said to me? He said, I've never fit anywhere else. I've never been uh, doing anything else all my life. All I've done since I've been saved and called to preach is prepare myself for this book. That gives me hope, doesn't it, you? So we're excited about that. So I hope, in hope, I keep saying I, I'm sorry, I, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Now, I don't know if you'll have this or not, but I bless the Lord for the uh, fact that I have the assurance that before the foundations of the world, I was in the heart of God. And in the program. You say that's because you're a preacher. No, that's because you're a born again believer. Right, right. If you're saved by the grace of God, it's all been a part of the eternal purposes of God. Yeah. And let me just go ahead and say to you, God can't lie. You say, I don't like the doctrine of election. But you've got to get over it because God is not going to change. God said clearly in the portion of scriptures before us that uh, this is the identification of his children and his church. Let me go on and point out to you that the Bible teaches us that Paul had a high estimate of Timothy. And you say, where is that? Look at 2 Corinthians, if you will. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, look at verse 23. He said, whether, let's see if I got the right portion, yes. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you or our brethren by inquire of they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. He referred to Titus as his partner and fellow helper. I don't know, that sounds like an honor to me to be recognized by the Apostle Paul with such uh, respect. Notice with me, if you will, next, the message of Titus. Paul's haste in leaving Titus at Crete made it necessary for him to encourage and instruct his faithful co-laborer. Let me just say, <laughs> say what you will, but it is an important thing to understand that you need to thoroughly prepare the people that are going to a ministry like Cream. And uh, Paul did that, but he had to do it in haste because of the need there. And though uh, Titus went down, and Paul had to write him to encourage him. Let me just say this to you. I was uh, in... Uh, I was in Cairo, actually in Ellsworth City teaching when, uh, uh, when Jerry and Carol Lilly sent me a text. And they don't know it, but it came at a prime time that I needed. Have you ever gotten a word from a fellow believer just in the nick of time? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Things were falling in and you were struggling and you were having a difficult time. Y'all got to understand that I talked in the mornings from 7 o'clock to 2 o'clock every day for four weeks. Every day. Four weeks. Only time I wasn't in the classroom teaching, I was in flight to the next classroom. So the point is, 
this that I'm saying is, uh, Jerry said, we saw pictures of you uh, in your teaching and stuff, and I told Carol, look at that guy, he is worn out. He was, he was deserting it right. But I want to say this to you, what a way to go. I want to say this out loud. I love it so much that I'm willing to die over there if that's what happens. And uh, we're looking at other places. Lord willing, we're going to Uganda this next trip and see if we can't establish a school there. You say, Pastor David, is this, is this the will of God? It's the door he has opened for me. And it's very effectual. So now how am I to handle this? I must make it good work. Yes. Do you understand? If you don't understand what good works are, I hope you get it by tonight. And don't lay out tonight. Be back. You need it. Paul's haste to send uh, Titus out required him to write to give words of encouragement and instruction. Number two, the Cretans were difficult people to work with. Uh, I find it interesting that anywhere you go to a preacher's meeting, if a man has pastored any period of time, they'll say, how'd you do that? <laughs> and they think you had to compromise to stay. Uh, I'll leave that alone. But what a blessing it is that uh, Paul uh, was instructing him how to deal with heretics. And we'll deal with this as we go along. You know that in chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, he's talking about the Grecians and the false teachers. He said, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Grecians are always liars evil beasts, slow bellies. <laughs> this witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. So Paul is instructing him how to deal with these uh, hard to deal with church members, I guess. And further, he said, we do not know uh, who started the church, but he said, you've got to correct it because it's off rails. It's not headed in the right direction. And the church organization and the lives of the members has fallen into uh, disrepute. Uh, they lost their good reputation. And let me just say this to you. A disgrace is worse than uh, a struggling church. Don't allow us to be deceived and not walk in holiness, godliness. You can wind up in disgrace for the cause of God's grace. Two sources that lead to their Downfall, and we'll develop these as we study them later. Number one, the Judaizers, they mixed law and grace, and they were there confusing the people. Secondly, ignorant believers who abused the grace of God by turning it into license to sin. So the whole idea is he had a lot to deal with had problems to deal with. But the setting of the church in order is the primary thing. And Paul suggests, as he wrote, the first step included appointing qualified pastors or elders. Secondly, Paul warned Titus and the church about false teachers. And thirdly, Paul instructed them uh, in how to pastor difficult kinds of people. Uh, then, fourthly, to emphasize the truth of grace, giving its true meaning. 
saving grace always leads to godliness. Now I want you to look at the last chapter. And I want you to look at the last verse. It says, all that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Now this is a significant statement. If you'll notice, he said, grace be with you all. Now for us Southerners, we understand that. Uh, you all means everybody. <laughs> and what he was saying was, this letter is not just written to Titus, but it's written to the whole church. Now I want to say this to you. This book is going to be a book that points out to us what good works are. And uh, I've got a whole other message that I'll pick up. But for right now, the mandate. Note words that clarify Paul's burden. He wanted to see good works. And let me just say, good works are a major emphasis of this letter. So look with me, chapter one, look at verse 16. It says, uh, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Look at it, go some. In chapter 2, look at verse 7. The Bible says, In all things showing thyself a pattern of what? Good works. And this is a very important uh, explanation. He said a pattern of good works. In other words, he's saying that our works should adorn the grace work of God in our lives. Look, if you will, at verse 10. Not prolonging, prolonging, learning, can you say it? Prolonging, it is stealing by small uh, bits. He says, not stealing, but showing all good fidelity, faithfulness, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Now that word adorn means to make beautiful. How do you make grace beautiful? Adorning good works. And that's where I'm headed for tonight, so I'll ask you to uh, bear with me, but it's important to understand I was uh, blessed, and you were too, for many years uh, when our church used to be in Fairburn, Georgia. And uh, you remember Rita Zimmerman. Uh, she passed away this last year, and uh, I had the privilege to have a part in her funeral. She was a saint of God, and she was seen with the glory of God. But she could grow the most beautiful roses ever. I don't know if y'all ever went to her rose garden to see it, but it was something to visit. And I would go to her rose garden, and uh, she said to me, Pastor, do you think that the church would allow me to fix a bouquet of ro roses every Sunday? I said, sure. As long as you got roses, we'll love them. And you know what she would do? I know I saw them. They were yellow and orange and silver and purple. Most beautiful roses you've ever seen. And if you held up one rose by itself, it was beautiful. So my brother, when she made them a range of flowers, everything popped out. You know what they did? They adorned the roses. You know what your good works can be? Not something to save you, but because you are saved, you do good works. And you will cause 
the grace of God in your life to blossom. And everybody that sees it will see Christ and see the changed life and see the power of God. Amen. Let me plead with you. Uh, be back tonight. I'll talk to you about good works and what they are. Uh, most of us uh, have some false ideas about good works. But tonight, Lord, in heaviness, we will point out what good works really are. What a blessing it is to be able to do good works. You say, Pastor David, is it different than fruit? No, it is fruit. And let me say this to you. You're responsible to produce good fruits. You're responsible to produce good works. It is an exhortation in this epistle. He says, be zealous of good works. In other words, you got to work it. Good works are not just going to come popping out of you. You're going to have to want to do good works. Well, Dr. Jerry Moore used to say, there's a lot of places to serve God if you're willing to go where nobody else wants to go. You know what I learned? I learned a long time ago. People that love the Lord Jesus Christ, they want to leave behind a legacy that men and women can see it and say, I see the grace of God in his or her life. Stand. Thank you for your patience.